Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Church at RV Online. We've got a great service coming up as Pastor Jared continues the series, Seven Blessings. Last week, we were reminded of God's blessing through the blood of Jesus, a blessing we don't deserve, but one that God gives to us anyway. We're going to enter into a time of worship, then I'll be right back.
Welcome back. We've got Jared coming up next with a continuation of the series, Seven Blessings. But before we turn it over to him, I've got a few announcements. September 30th at 6 p.m., we're having our next worship night. Garden Music and a few guests will be leading us as we come together for a time of spiritual connection and prayer. The last one was absolutely amazing, and we know this one will be too. You can go to our website, to RSVP. Oh, and make sure you let us know if you're bringing kids five and under so we can provide childcare. We can't wait to spend a night of worship with you. See you there. If you're new here to the church and you don't know who Garden Music is, it's our wonderful worship team. They are an inspiring group of musicians and creatives who combine their talents to lead us in worshiping the Lord together. Coming up on October 1st, they will be releasing their next album, Songs for the Weary, and we can't wait to share it with you. Keep a lookout for more information. Well, we're finally reaching the fall season. You know what that means. Groups are starting back up. We would love for you to get connected and find a group so that you can be a part of getting to meet fellow Christ followers and help each other grow in our relationship with God. We have groups for all ages and all walks of life. Check out our website to find the right one for you. Seniors, you don't want to miss a great event coming up on September 29th you will get to travel to Israel from the comfort of your own chair. We have a great presentation for you where you'll be visiting and learning all about the biblical sites of Israel, followed by a Mediterranean lunch and discussion. Contact Pastor Pam for registration details. And finally, giving to the church is about much more than just a financial transaction. The church at RB wants to see God grow in you a spirit of generosity that spills out in all areas of your life. Giving to the mission of his church it's really an act of worship, one that develops your relationship with him and leads you to so much more of what he has in store for you. If you're in a position to give, visit crb.gives today. Up next, Pastor Jared continues our series, Seven Blessings. Enjoy.
So good to see you. We're having some church this morning, all right? We're going to have some church this morning. 
five of you. <laughs> ah, I, uh, I, I'm a church guy. I, I love church. I grew up in church. I remember as a kid going to church seven nights a week, I think, we were in church at my church. Anybody else grow up like that? It was like Monday night was visitation, Tuesday night was testimony night, Wednesday night was, uh, I don't know what we were doing on Wednesday night, but we were there, man. We were just always there, and uh, I just love, I love coming, and there's something about that moment where uh, the song is sung, the scriptures are opened, and it doesn't matter what's happened in your week, you step in into the scriptures, you step into the local community and it just washes over you, whether you're joining us in person or online. So glad uh, to have you in the community today. We're in the middle of a series called Seven Blessings. And this series, week in and week out, what we're doing is we're looking at an Old Testament story and we're taking uh, the life of, of Abraham today and we're unlocking the, the blessing that Abraham is receiving and connecting it to Jesus and seeing how that blessing is for you. It's, it's for me. And so often we read the Old Testament like it's just a warm-up act for Jesus. It's the band you have to sit through until the, the real lead singer comes out. And I get that at a certain level because all of the scriptures are pointing to Jesus. But at the same time, there's a power in the Old Testament. We don't always give the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, they're due. And so there's a blessing in these stories. And so last week we talked about the blessing of blessing. And today I want to talk about the blessing of promise. And really at the heart of today, what today is about, if I could reduce Christianity down to five words, if I had to give one last sermon, this is the last sermon. This is it. Okay. I'm not saying it is, but I'm saying if I had to, uh, if I only had five words to put Christianity to, to, in, in, in cement where you, you saw it, it's, it's this. It's trust God, surrender the outcomes. Those are the five words. I'm not a tattoo guy. I have no tattoos. I, I love people that do. But if I were to get a tattoo, man, it would be trust God, surrender the outcomes. Because that's the whole thing. Because if you're anything like me, isn't it true? We spend an enormous amount of energy, anxiety, stress, trying to control outcomes in our life. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Right now, you're, you're trying to manipulate somebody to get the outcome you want. You're thinking about, if I do this, what's going to happen? It could be a financial situation. It could be a work situation. It could be a relationship you're in the middle of, and you don't know what to do. And you're spending so much time, so much energy trying to control the outcome and faith. And this is what we see through Abraham today. It's a blessing. It's a promise that comes to you and I. It says, God, God is saying to you and me, hey, if you just trust me, Surrender the outcomes and relax in the mystery of who I am as your God and what I will do in your life. Trust God, surrender the outcomes. And my hope and my prayer today is that, I don't know what the circumstance is, it might be a phone call that you know you need to make, but you're so nervous about the outcome of that phone call. It could be uh, a situation you need to get out of, but you're so nervous about the outcome of getting out of it that you and I would be people who say, God, you know what, I'm going to relax in the mystery, I'm going to trust you and surrender the outcome. And there's the blessing of promise that God's given to you and I, that if we do that, we lean not on our own understanding. He's faithful with us in our journey of life. And he wants to be just as unique with you as he is with Abraham. If you have a Bible, open it with me to Genesis chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along on the screens. And I want us to take a look at uh, this guy, Abraham. You know the song, Father Abraham. Uh, You have some of you singing it now. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, That's the good Christians on the front row uh, singing Father Abraham. Had many sons and many sons. We got a few more of you. Yeah. You're you're not, you know, heathens because you're not on the front row. I get it. I get it. I love it. Uh, Genesis chapter 12. Uh, We're going to start in verse or sorry, Genesis 11, verse 27. Then we'll get to Genesis 12. Uh, And there's a couple pieces to this. First is, what's the position of my life that I need to be in to receive the blessings of God? 
And when I receive the blessing, what's the purpose of the blessing once I've got it? And that's what Abraham unlocks for us today. It's, it's a promise that comes to him, but there is a position he has to be in and you ha- have to be in to receive the blessing of God. And then there's a purpose to it once you've got it. And so I want to unlock both of those today. And this is uh, the story. Genesis chapter 11, we'll start in verse 27. This is the account of Terah's family line. Uh, Terah is the father of Abram. Now, Abram, sometimes he's called Abraham. Uh, and that's not some modern update. He gets renamed Abraham, but don't get confused by that. Abram, Abraham, they both mean father uh, or patriarch. That's who he is. Uh, Terah's his dad. And he's the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot, while his father Terah, there will be a quiz on this at 1130, so I hope you all remember this. His father Terah was still alive. Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans, real people, real places, in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married, and the name of Abram's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the, uh, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarah was childless, so Abraham, he's about 75 years old at this point, and his wife cannot have a child. That factors in later. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, the wife of his son Abram, And together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But eh, they didn't make it. When they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, the father of Abraham, and he died in Haran. Now the Lord, verse 1 of chapter 12, had said to Abram, and this is the setup for the blessing he's going to receive, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land of that I will show you. Now, what is he doing here? God's saying, hey, I want you to step out. I know for 75 years, Ur of the Chaldeans, Haran, that's what you've known, traveling through life with your father, uh, Terah, but I want you to step out in faith. Well, where are we going? You'll find out later, Abraham, uh, but I want you to trust me. And he's positioning himself. He's putting himself in a position to receive the blessing of God that's about to fall on him. Now, typically when we start reading about Abraham, we start reading in Genesis 12. That's where the blessing comes, this sort of sevenfold promise that he receives. But to really get the context of Genesis 12, you have to go to Genesis 11, because at this point, humanity has reached a dead end. The consequences of Adam and Eve's choices in the Garden of Eden have culminated in a dark world, And Genesis 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 shows you the destruction that's come to humanity. And there's only one guy, his name is Seth, who still calls upon the name of the Lord. But the strand of faith is about to be sniffed out, snuffed out like a winter fire. Uh, The the lineage of all of humanity is coming to an end. There is no hope for humanity. And it is in this dark place, God is going to raise up Abraham and say, come follow me. I'm going to do something through you, Abraham. And it makes no sense to him because his, his father is certainly not a follower of Yahweh or of God. His father, uh, his father's name is Terah, which means moon. And he lives in Ur of the Chaldeans, uh, which would be the, the Chaldeans were the people of moon worship. And that's who his father is. His father is a moon worshiper. <laughs> And he's, he does what most people in the ancient world have done at this point. They're making gods out of natural things and worshiping what they see. And that's Abraham's father. And God is going to call Abraham to step out of the moon worshiping tribe. I'm going to do something new through you. And he's like many of you. Abraham is the first link in a family chain of faith. Uh, some of you within the sound of my voice, you are the first link in the chain of faith in your family. And generations are going to be blessed through your act of obedience of hearing God speak to you and you trusting God and putting yourself in a position to receive blessings in your life from God, but not just for you, for your sons, for your daughters, for their children. Blessings will come not just to you, but but through you 
and you're going to be a conduit of that. Uh, I'm not a first generation Christian. I uh, am a part of a long lineage of faith. And many of you, you are uh, the beneficiaries of parents, grandparents who took you to church when you were a kid. And I was reminded of this uh, a, a few weeks ago. Uh, in June of this year, I lost my last uh, living grandparent. I was fortunate enough to know all four of my grandparents. And my last grandmother uh, passed away at 91 years old uh, in uh, June of this year. We called her Magama which is the Hebrew word for 80-pound spitfire. Uh, <laughs> she was a fiery woman who always told you what she thought. Every time I talked to her, she, uh, sh- she would wake up every Sunday morning and she would watch uh, David Jeremiah, a famous pastor here in San Diego, so you know who David Jeremiah is. And uh, she would watch David Jeremiah and then she would watch our church gathering and she would remind me constantly that I was her second favorite preacher in San Diego. <laughs> And I was fine with it. Uh, and she, uh, she always told you what she thought. I love that about Magama. And my mom, and many of you have done this, she was cleaning out my grandmother's house, her mom, and she came across this Bible from, I think it's from about 1946. And it was my grandmother Magama's Bible from her freshman year of college, and it's written in King James, and I've been doing my, uh, my quiet times in the morning out of it, and I'm telling you, she, 19 years old, 18 years old, was highlighting, underlining every verse in this Bible. And it's reminded me that I am stepping into a long lineage of faith in my family. I'm benefiting from her faithfulness in 1944, and it's been kind of weird because I'm reading like prayers she prayed, and I, I can see, like, guys she was mad at. I'm not so sure I was supposed to read this. <laughs> she has this one boyfriend named George. She compared to the Gattery and Demoniac in, in the notes of her Bible. And I benefit from her faith. And many of you in the room, you... you you benefit from the lineage of faith. But for many of you, you're first generation. You're, you're Abraham in your story. And you're the one that stood up and said, I'm not going to worship the idols of my father. I'm going to step away from that lineage that's been handed to me. And I'm going to turn towards God. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And for you, if that's you today... I, I, I want you to know in your faith journey of bringing your kids to church and praying over your sons and daughters and your kids watching you be generous to God and not just yourself, you, you don't even know what hangs in the balance for generations of your family. In your act of obedience, you are putting a strong link in a chain today and you are a conduit of blessing that is going to flow through you. Don't lose sight of what hangs in the balance. At the same time, if you are third generation, fourth generation Christ follower, and you just sort of, you kind of had to. I mean, as a kid, you just kind of had to go to church, and you kind of stumbled back into it later. At some point in your life, you will have to have an Abraham moment, even if it's generational for you, where faith becomes personal to you. Listen, you cannot ride coattails to blessings. It doesn't work that way. At some point, you have to hear God say to you, move, uh, do something, trust me, let, let the chips fall where they may, but trust me, surrender the outcomes. And you have to have that moment in your faith. And I, I, I've been reading the King James, and so I, I, there's something about the King James that I, when I read it, it just speaks to me in a different way. And I've never really been a King James Version guy, but I, I love it now. And I've, I've been reading her notes, and it's been awesome. And I've been walking around the house speaking in King, King James to my kids. And uh, my uh, oldest actually said to me this morning, he goes, Dad, why do you always sound like Jesus now? <laughs> and uh, I had to break it to him. It was actually Shakespeare, not, you know, anyway. Um, <laughs> But I, uh, it, verse 1 of chapter 12, when you read it in the King James, I love this. It says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country. I love that. Get thee out. And from thy kindred and from my father's house unto a land I will shoo, show, shoo, shoo thee. Uh, get thee out. And at some point in your faith, 
you will hear God say to you, whether you're third generation Christian, first generation, uh, get thee out. If you read it in Hebrew, it's, Abraham's like, I can't get out. I'm 75. He's like, no, you got to get yourself out. And you have to put yourself in a position like Abraham, where you are saying, God, I'm going to trust you and surrender the outcome. And where is it in your life? Maybe it's current. You, you hear God say, get thee out. Don't stay here. Trust me. And you don't even know where you're going, but you're going, God, I'm going to get thee out. It could be at some moment in your life. You're maybe it's, it's when you were 17. That was the moment you got thee out of a circumstance. It could be at 17, you had all the wrong friends and you grew up in church but then 16, 17, you had the wrong crew around you. And at some point, maybe it was at a youth camp, maybe there was sawdust on the floor, but you heard God say to you, get the out of those friendships. Get, get out. Just, and you knew, you could see it clear as day. And at 17, you got the out and you became a candidate in that moment for the blessings of God because you put yourself in a position where you said, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know who my prom date is going to be now. <laughs> but your faith story connects back to that moment where you heard God say, get thee out, and you got out. It could be in college where you were a generational Christian, leader of the campus ministry, but you were dating the guy. You were dating the girl. You knew you didn't need to date, and you heard God say, get thee out. And you were like, but I thee like him. <laughs> But you knew what you needed to do, and it, uh, it pained you, and you walked forward, and you trusted God, and you got the out. And you can pinpoint your faith journey to 20 years old, where you heard God speak to you, and you became a candidate in that moment for the blessings of God to fall on you because you got the out. It could be right now you're in a business situation, and you know the crew that you're doing business with is not who you need to be partnered up with, and you're thinking through all the outcomes. Well, there's a lot of money on the line. And if I could just do this for 18 months or two years, but you just hear God saying over you, get the out. And the moment you get the out, you become a candidate for the blessings of God to intersect with your life in a powerful way because you're trusting God and saying, okay, God, I, I, what do you have for me? Because I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this and I'm going to get the out. And that's the moment for Abraham, and that becomes the moment for us. What, what's your get the out moment in your faith story? That's the moment you become a candidate for the blessings of God. I, 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 you probably think about your kid's future a lot. You probably think about uh, your grandkids' future and uh, college education and all those things, but pray over your sons, pray over your daughters, that at some moment in their life, when they're in high school or college, when they hear God say, get thee out, they would step forward in obedience, because in that moment, they won't just be recipients of secondary blessings, they will become candidates for the primary blessings of God in their story. Get thee out. Get thee out. Well, the question is, in that moment, when you get thee out, okay, God, where thee to? <laughs> where are we going? What's the plan? And that's where the faith element comes in, because in that moment, that's where I'm going, okay, God, I'll get thee out, but I need to know what's the destination? What's the plan? As long as there's you know, a honeymoon suite, and there's a car, and there's a job offer, as long as there's a whatever it is, I'll, as long as I know what that looks like, I'll get the out. And that's not how the faith journey works. God says, no, relax in the mystery. Trust me. This is Abraham's story over and over again. He, uh, God comes to him at 75 and says, get the out. And he steps forward. He's like, okay, where are we going? God's like, I'll show you later. He's a hundred years old. And God comes to him and says, you're going to have a child now. Okay. Uh, can you explain that? And God says, I'll show you later. Uh, we'll read this story in just a second, but he finally has a child at 100, Isaac. And God says, I want you to climb the mount, mountain, Mount Moriah, and surrender the child, sacrifice the child. And that's a weird story. We're going to read it in just a second. And he's like, why? How, like what? And God's like, just climb the mountain. Just do what I say. And over and over again, he's having to relax in the mystery of trusting God. And although he does not know where he's going, he knows who he's following. And that's the position of blessing. That's the position God wants you and I in. And you don't want to be in that position. You want to know the outcome. But God says, lean not on your own understanding. 
surrender the outcome, and in that place of confusion, in that place of trust, in that act of obedience, you're a candidate for the blessings of God to intersect with your life in a powerful, unique way. And that's what happens to Abraham. Now we're going to read the next part of this. And it's important to say that the narrative of Abraham is not normative. And what I mean by that is God's going to be unique with you and your story and your act of obedience and the risks that you take to trust God. But it's going to look different than Abraham. God's probably not going to ask you to have children at 100 years old. I don't know. I would never put anything past God. But I don't think that's going to happen in your story. God's probably not going to raise up a nation through you. But what is applicable from this story is that in the same way God establishes a covenant bond with Abraham, he has established through the blood of Christ a covenant bond with you. And a covenant bond is different than every relationship that you have in your life. Uh, A covenant bond, we really don't have many covenant bonds really left anymore. Marriage, uh, your relationship with your children, but most of our relationships are consumer relationships, which means I'll give you something, you give me something. If we're ever done with each other, it's over. And I'm a means to an end for you. You're a means to an end for me. And God has entered into a covenant bond with Abraham. And he has entered into a covenant relationship with you. Which means regardless of what you do, God unconditionally says to you, trust me. And the promises of, of, of God are extended to you. And I will never let you go. I will never forsake you. I am with you. Even in the most confusing moments of your business. Even in the most confusing moments of your marriage. Trust me. Lean not on your own understanding. And I am in a covenant bond. For God, you are not a means to an end. For your boss, you are a means to an end. But for God, you are the end. You're the goal. And he's in a covenant connection with you. And he's established that with Abraham. So it's going to look different than it does uh, for you and I, than it does for Abraham. But it's, it's a covenant bond. And he says this to Abraham. He says, look, here's the deal. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. So there's a promise that comes. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who you bless. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed for you. And God raises up in the darkest moment in human history. This one guy who says, I'll follow. And relax in the mystery of where you're going to go. And God says, here's the plan. I'm going to bless you so that you bless others. And nations are going to come through you. Religions are going to come through you. The lineage of Christ is going to come through you. The covenant's been established with you you're blessed. Now keep in mind, I love this. Uh, Abraham does not ask for this, does he? If I'm Abraham, my prayer is much smaller in this moment than will you bless everybody in the future of the world through me? My prayer in this moment, if I'm Abraham, is like, okay, God, you got me away from the moon worshipers. I actually appreciate that because they were getting a little weird for me. But maybe like 40 acres on the outskirts of Ur where, you know, it's like a a day's donkey ride in to see mom and dad, but not too close for comfort. I'll take like 40 acres and Sarah and I can have a couple kids and we'll be on the patio and we'll drink coffee in the morning and watch the sunset. That's all I'm looking for. Just like 40 acres, God. And God's like, actually, no, uh, a whole nation's going to be raised up through you. And the promise that he gets, the blessing he gets is land that he's never even going to live on. And This is actually how you know you're being blessed by God because the thing that you receive, it's actually not for you. Have you ever noticed when you read about somebody getting blessed in the scriptures? We read it and we're like, that doesn't sound like a blessing. That sounds like a curse. Mary, the mother of Jesus, you get blessed with baby Jesus in your womb. And she's blessed. She says, they will call me blessed. And she's, she's 14 in the backwater town of the Roman Empire. And she now is a, a scandal in her town. She could be killed for this. And she's going, I'm blessed. I'm, re-. I'm like, no, that's a curse. And that's how you know it's the blessings of God. Because when you really get blessed by God, it's not for you, it's actually for somebody else. Abraham is going to live his life between the the gap of the promise and the reality. He's going to live a nomadic existence. He's going to be interacting with different tribes, different tongues. He's going to go on this crazy quest of following God. 
and the whole time he's never going to have the place for him. It's always for somebody else. And that's how the blessings of God work. It's, it's a principle in the scriptures. If you live your life just to bless yourself, you will end up cursed. But if you receive the blessings that you receive and you go, these are actually not for me, they're for somebody else, you will be blessed by God in the process. And that's actually how you get blessed by being a conduit, not a consumer, but you're a conduit of the blessings you receive. Say, this is for somebody else. God's given this to me. And when you start treating the blessings you receive like hot potato, you just want to get it off of you. Because it's, it's actually, God's not just giving me this because he's, he thinks I'm so special. And wow, look at, you know, God's given me all this because, you know, he thinks I deserve a fountain in the bedroom and, you know, a collection of cars that all have vanity plates that say hashtag blessed. And I can, you know, just kind of hoard all my stuff because God just thinks I'm so special. And I'm so sorry for all those people who are stressed because look at me, I'm hashtag blessed. I just, you know, I, I, that's, that's, the, that's what I want blessing to be. And God said, no, no, no. The blessings are not for you. The purpose of them, when you put yourself in the position, say, hey God, I'm going to trust you. And then you start to receive the blessings of God. It's not for you. It's for somebody else. We typically think of blessings as, well, God made me so successful that I now have Everything I ever wanted, I could spend money wherever. I wanted to fly to Milan tomorrow and buy a pair of silk pants and take a private jet home. Wow, I'm so blessed. If I wanted to ride a white pony down the coast of Del Mar all the way to Malibu tomorrow, wow, that's, that's the blessed individual. And if I'm really blessed, God's going to insulate me from anybody who's not like me. And I'll just kind of hang out with my pod of family, people who talk like me, act like me, think like me. That, that's blessing. And the blessings of God, when they hit you, the purpose of them are never for what you intend. They're always for somebody else. And that's, that's how you know it's like the blessings of God. It's, it's, I'm a conduit. They're for somebody else. Uh, Abraham, in his journey... He's constantly being forced into relationships. I don't think he wants any part in. He's, he's not looking for this, but he's now living a nomadic life and God's bringing him into intersection with people who have different backgrounds, tribes, tongues, political views, gods. He's interacting and, and when God's really blessing you, he starts placing you in the middle of circumstances and people going, how did I get here? <laughs> Why am I in the middle of this? He's moving you up and moving you out into things where God's using you and your gifts and your talents to influence people who you have nothing in common with. And the blessings of God, the possessions you receive, the gifts you have, you start going, none of this is actually for me. We have this statement as a church that we are good neighbors. And I get asked a lot, well, what does that mean? Is that just kind of like a nice little phrase that you guys threw up on the website. Uh, no, it is a constant reminder to us that, that we're blessed by God, that God has given us blessings as a church, uh, resources, people, a facility, whatever it is, his scriptures. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing as a community. And those blessings aren't so we just kind of sit in a holy huddle as a church and high five and say, let's put a fountain in the lobby and maybe once a year we'll baptize somebody in it. Woohoo! Uh, the, the blessings are for us to give away, that we're to bless the neighborhood, that the city around us would open their eyes and say, we're being blessed because the people in that facility are recipients of God's blessing and are a conduit of it, a conduit of it to the neighborhood. They don't just want to hoard the blessing and go, wow, aren't we lucky? We want to be dispensers of the blessing, good neighbors who give it away when we receive it. That's that's how the blessing works. The position of the blessing, you got to step out. The purpose of the blessing, it's not for you. Who's being blessed by your blessing? That's the Abraham question. Now, what does any of this have to do with Jesus? Well, the New Testament writers call back to Abraham all the time. And probably the signpost story of Abraham's life that points us to Jesus is the story of Isaac. If you have a Bible, Genesis 22, I want to read this uh, quickly. But he has a son named Isaac at 100, 
and God, and, and this is the scripture that every atheist you ever meet who does not believe in God always points to this story. And they'll say, how can you believe the Bible? Don't you know God in the Old Testament was mean and he did crazy stuff? And, you know, I had uh, somebody not that long ago tell me, I only read the New Testament. I'm like, why? They're like, well, because God's finally nice in the New Testament. Uh, and there's stories like this. And it's what Augustine said, the, the Old Testament is concealed uh, or the Old Testament is revealed in the new, but it's concealed in the old. And stories like this, we read them and we go, well, that's bizarre, but it's pointing us to Jesus. And I want to show you how. He has a son named Isaac, and God says, I want you to sacrifice Isaac. I want Isaac to die. And you're reading that, you're like, how could God do that? But you have to read it in connection to the whole sweep of the scriptures. Verse 2 of Genesis 22. Then God said, take your son, your only son. Hint, hint, what is this about? Whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Now, Isaac is going to be sacrificed on Mount Moriah. That's the mountain that God says, I want you to climb. And he's like, why? He's like, just trust me, just climb. And Mount Moriah, I didn't realize this until a few years ago. I went to uh, Golgotha in Jerusalem, which is uh, where Christ was crucified. And when you stand at Golgotha, it's called the place of the skull. It's located, it's a little foothill at the base of Mount Moriah. So the same place where God tells Abraham 4,000 years earlier, sacrifice Isaac is the exact same place where Christ is crucified on the cross. And so this place, God is doing something for the nations, for generations to come in this moment that Abraham's not even aware of. But you and I, in retrospect, get to see it. And Paul's going to connect the dots. He says this, verse 4, On the third day, did anything else significant happen in Christianity on the third day? (laughs) Yes. Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. And he said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy, he's got Isaac, who's probably 12 years old or so, over there. We will worship and then we'll come back to you. And Isaac's in the dark. He doesn't know what's going on. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself, Isaac, carried the fire and the knife. So Isaac is going to carry the the wood that he's going to be killed on to the place of his death. Is this about something else? Yes. Who else carried their death device themselves? Christ. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up, and he's in the dark, and he said to his father Abraham, "Uh, Dad, uh, yes, my son, Abraham said, the fire and the wood are here, uh, but we seem to not have a sacrifice. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Which in Hebrew uh, translates awkward. But the angel of the Lord called out uh, from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. So Abraham's going to follow through. And this is, this is what the story of Isaac is all about over and over again. Abraham, just trust me. Be obedient to me. Surrender the outcome. Trust me. Surrender the outcomes. Trust me. Surrender the outcome. So that you and I, as the people of God, thousands of years later, will know in any circumstance, if we trust God and surrender the outcome, he's faithful. And it says, do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. So Isaac is set free. And he reiterates the promise, I will bless you and I will make descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. And Abraham's got to be like, whoo, you mean I don't have to follow through with killing my son? And he's like, no, I'm, again, trust me, surrender the outcome. And it says in the next part, then Abraham returned to his servants and they set out together for Beersheba. And Abraham stayed in Beersheba because after that he needed a beer. Um, (laughs) Like, man, that was stressful, God, that you did all that. What is this story about? Third day. It's about Jesus. Carries the sacrifice himself. It's about Jesus. He's going to be killed on Mount Moriah, the very place of Golgotha, the place of the skull where Christ is crucified. What doesn't happen to Isaac happens to Christ. And Paul connects the dots. Galatians chapter 3 Starting in verse 14, what does all this have to do with you? What does it all have to do with me? He says this, 
He redeemed us. God redeems us. Christ redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Now, you don't call yourself a Gentile, but you're a Gentile. That's who you are. Uh, You and I, through Christ Jesus, the blessing given to Abraham because of the sacrifice of Christ has come to us so that by faith we might receive the blessing of the promise, the promise of the what? The Spirit. So now you've got the Spirit of God inside of you who has sealed the promise in you that God has made. And you go, well, what does that mean? Through Abraham, God made a covenant bond. He said, everywhere you go, trust me, surrender the outcome. I don't care how confused you are. I don't care what you don't understand. Just climb the mountain, go, leave your faith or your family. Uh, Trust me, surrender the outcome. Trust me, surrender the outcome. And that covenant bond through Abraham, it wasn't ended in Christ. It's completed and it's brought into a new bond, a new covenant that you and I have through the blood of Christ where God has said to you and God has said to me, anywhere you go in your life, no matter what you're going through, no matter what the circumstance is, the Spirit of God is inside of you and I'm walking with you. I'm walking not just with you, I'm walking in you, in your skin. And you can trust in any moment that if you surrender the outcome, even when you're confused, even when you don't understand, the promise has been given to you that I will be faithful to you in those circumstances. And you can surrender the outcome to me because I am a faithful God to you. And I want you to walk in that blessing everywhere you go. You may not feel blessed today. You might feel cursed. And you're going, I don't know what I'm going to do. Lean not on your own understanding. Trust God, surrender the outcome. And no, just like Abraham, you trust God, surrender the outcome. And God is working all things together for good. You trust God, you lean not on your own understanding, and you surrender the outcome. God works in those moments with your act of obedience. There's a covenant that he's made with you. Not through the blood of Isaac, but through the blood of Christ. And it's been sealed with the promise of the spirit that you have received. And he says, in the same way I was faithful to Abraham, I will be faithful to you. And where in your life right now do you hear God say, get thee out? Where's the place, the risky ground in front of you that you don't want to step because you know what it means? I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know where this is going. If I do this, God, then what? I don't understand. And all your energy is being spent trying to control the outcomes. And he says, trust me, I am God. And for thousands of years and thousands of generations, I have proven my faithfulness time and time again, all the way back to your ancestors of Abraham. In this moment, be another link in the chain of faithfulness to step forward so the generations that come after you can tell a story of your faithfulness of when you trusted God and you didn't know where it was going and you just said I don't know where I'm going I don't know how it's going to work out I just know who I'm following and I'm surrendering the outcome you're probably thinking about the amount of money you'll give to your grandkids or your kids one day think about the legacy of faith you want to leave to them and being a link in that chain to tell that story of trusting God and surrendering the outcomes. Mom and dad, come hell or high water, we trusted God and we surrendered the outcome. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will trust God and surrender the outcomes. All kinds of storms come at us, but we know we're gonna trust God and we're gonna surrender the outcomes. We don't understand in the middle of the world what's going on, but we know what we're gonna do. As for me and my house, we are trusting God and we are surrendering the outcome. And we're gonna tell a story like Abraham did of how the blessings of God and the favor of God fell on us in the most mysterious of moments of our life where we didn't know, but we just took a step forward and said, we don't know where we're going. We know who we're following. We're trusting God and we're surrendering the outcomes. I want you to have that story, but you got to step. You got to risk. And you will get a story of the faithfulness of God falling on you. Let's pray together. Let's go to the Lord together this morning. God, I thank you for that. Sealed with a promise by the blood of Jesus. The narrative is not normative. God, you're not going to ask us to 
climb a mountain and sacrifice our kids. You're not going to ask us to have a child at 100 years old, but you are going to ask us to step forward in faith. And there's somebody within the sound of my voice that might mean make it a phone call, but they're so nervous about the outcome of that phone call. It could be for somebody, it's a move. It could be for somebody, there's an act of just stepping into a relationship with Jesus for the first time. And God, I pray today, would you honor that act of obedience? Would they surrender the outcome and leave the rest to you? Would we be the kind of people who let the chips fall where they may, however it works out, what is going to be said over our life is that we were like Abraham. We stepped out in faith and we surrendered the outcome and we didn't lean on our understanding. We leaned deeply on the voice of God over our life and said, trust me, surrender the outcome. That's the story I want. I I pray, God, there's sons and daughters on the other side of this wall who will tell stories, not just about what they learned at this church, but about the moms and the dads they watched in this room. Trust God and surrender the outcomes. Would we be those kind of grandparents? Would we be those kind of moms and dads who lean not on our own understanding, but the story of faith that we leave for the next generation is a story that says we trust God and we surrender the outcome. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray and all of God's children said, grace and peace. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but see.
you're faithful.